welcome everybody and thank you for attending our second Spark Lecture. Uh, I'm Eric Ryan with the Santa Barbara Sunrise Rotary Club. Spark was created by <clears throat> Central Coast Rotary Clubs as a way to engage people from home and promote insight and understanding in our community. Our first Spark Lecture was from former NASA astronaut Ed Liu and his project to build a map of our solar system. If you missed that, we'll be posting a recording of the lecture online. Tonight, Spark presents Inclusion in Action. George Floyd's uh, killing um, and nationwide protests that were incited as a result of it, and the disproportionate numbers of African Americans who are dying from the coronavirus show that both racism and inequality persist in this country. We have an excellent panel of Rotarians of different ages and backgrounds to speak about their experiences. They've given their time to this program in the hope that it will ignite each of us to take action to encourage and help African Americans within our personal networks and organizations who are often impeded by institutional and personal bias. I'd like to give special thanks to Scott Burns from our Rotary Club, who is the organizer of tonight's event. Scott felt that a Spark Lecture was a good first step to promoting change, and he devoted his time and his energy to bring other Rotarians to the effort. We are honored to have co-moderators Wade Nomura and Tina Ballou tonight. Wade is our panel moderator, and Tina will be moderating the Q&A. In addition to Rotary, Tina puts her considerable PR, fundraising, and event production skills to work for United Boys and Girls Clubs of Santa Barbara County. Wade Nomura is an expert in project development and management. His Rotary resume would take half of the evening, but he has done about everything there is to do in Rotary. He has been a leader in Rotary for many years and has participated in over 50 international projects. Wade was also a world-class athlete. For any of you who are BMX fans, he invented the Nomura BMX racing bike and then won multiple national championships riding it. And finally, apparently for lack of a good hobby or something, Wade happens to be the mayor of Carpinteria. Wade, I'm gonna hand the webinar over to you. Uh, to introduce the panel. Thank you very much and thank you everybody for participating. I especially want to thank the uh, Santa Barbara Sunrise Club for putting this together. Uh, it's going to be one outstanding event. We are going to go through the panel uh, one at a time. I will be introducing them as they come through. Our next speaker is Tom Rhodes, um, originally from the frozen tundra of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, he now resides in the sun and surf of Santa Barbara, California. Tom holds a bachelor's of degree in psychology and behavioral science from Wisconsin and an MBA in finance from Northeastern University. He works uh, in business development for Revenir, uh, a health care technology company. And by the way, um, for you athletes out there, in 2000, he played in the Final Four College uh, basketball in West, uh, for Wisconsin. He also asked me to mention that, and since this is um, some information for you, my late friend, Wat Misaka, was the first person of color to play in the NBA. He was drafted in 1947, the same year that Jackie Robinson was recruited into baseball, and believe it or not, three years before the first black was uh, allowed to play in the NBA. With that, Tom, it's all you. Thank you, Wade. I'm going to get a couple, uh, uh, couple in quickly. One quick correction, my friend. Uh, I, I was a manager of our 2000 uh, Final Four team because uh, I know uh, some of my teammates are watching. And, uh, I don't want them to call me out. It yeah, sounds good. My apologies. All good. Uh, quickly want to give uh, a shout out to my wife, Lexi, my daughter, Laurel, my hometown, Milwaukee, and my parents, Thomas and Kathy Rhodes, who still live there. Uh, we made a diamond in this one. All right. Let's get started. I'm passionate about this topic because they helped me develop two life skills, building rapport with others, being comfortable in my own skin. See, I started this uh, 
by Googling my hometown, at first glance, I, saw, I found this image here, <laughs> the perception, advance, versus the reality, advance. Next slide. You know, when I share my experience, I want to get to, you know, what was my experience? You know, the stark contrast between the perception, advance, and the reality is striking. Advance. See, I faced racism growing up. It took two familiar forms. One, segregated neighborhoods. Shout out to the north side of Milwaukee. Segregation in Milwaukee was due in large part to redlining. Redlining was a, a policy created in 1933, Franklin Roosevelt administration. Basically, it's, uh, it's when a bank, a mortgage lender, lender um, denies a loan uh, to, uh, for someone looking to buy a house in a certain area of a community based upon their race. The other form of racism was segregated schools. And that's what I'm gonna focus on. De facto segregation was how they call it. And this is basically racial segregation based upon discriminatory, uh, discriminatory practices like redlining. See, I integrated my high school. I was the third black to ever graduate from my high school. This is in 33 years. Next slide. Living in a black neighborhood while being bused to a white wool high school was one of the hardest things I had to overcome. See, chapter 220 was the name given to the busing program that brought me to Sussex. It was a difficult experience for the most part. Innocent fun like bubbler rides, epithets directed at you either scratched on your locker or spray painted on the exterior wall of the school or the one I remember most vividly, the severed cow head left in my locker next to me as a message. Next slide. See, I had a lot of interactions, both bad and good, that promoted my success, but it was hard to fit in. Why? The environment was night and day, contrast from my life in the city. Black and white, urban versus rural, Academics, sports, mainly football and track, forensics and debate provided these team settings where I could connect with some of my classmates on a more personal level. Although for the most part, we're wearing the same colors, advance. Pride though, was often only visible in one color. I was hungry, thirsty to get a good education and improve my life. The skills I picked up and honed, the relationships I made were key in me reaching my goal to attend the University of Wisconsin and play football. I love this picture. See, this picture captures a piece of black history at Wisconsin and depicts a call for help. See, this isn't the story of my glory as, as my time as a college football player. Hey, I played one season, I was redshirted. I never played in a, a regular season or a postseason game. This is a call for help so that more black people have the opportunity to succeed in life because of, because of American institutions rather than in spite of them. Next slide. This slide depicts the class ladder in America. Where you fall on this ladder and your ability to move up it will determine much of your life experience in America. Why is this important? Take my ceiling is on this ladder. I've never made more in all my years, 20 years professional experience, 16 years selling, this degree, that degree, athlete this, work for this company, that company. I've never made over $200,000 in a year. I've been doing this for 20 years. Next slide. 
where do you even start if you're black? There are so many factors to consider. This is where our viewers come in. You want to help a black person succeed? Next slide. Be a mentor to a black person. Help them. Take on the left, Val Phillips, civil rights leader. She focused on the housing in the city of Milwaukee, but she was more than that. You're looking at the first African-American woman to graduate from the University of Wisconsin Law School. She's the first African-American judge in the state of Wisconsin. She's the first African-American secretary of state in the state of Wisconsin. She teamed up with Father James Groppy, who fought school segregation. They worked together to make a substantive change in the city of Milwaukee. I'll take my own example in closing. Alan Zussman. See, when I graduated from Wisconsin, I only interviewed with one company, Philip Morris USA. I had no idea what I wanted to do when I graduated. Six months Six later, months when I realized that I needed a job, I had to get to work. I went to a payphone and I called back to Wisconsin. I called Alan Zussman and I asked him, hey, do you think Philip Morris is still hiring? 10 days later, I was on a plane to Minneapolis, Minnesota to begin my career at Philip Morris USA. I've been selling business development 20 years later, ever since. Thanks for your time. Use your privilege to help a black person make good trouble. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, excellent message, excellent presentation. I want the audience to take a look at what he actually talked about. A lot of it had to do with specifically um, equity. That is what the new word is, and it's not equality, it's equity. When we talk about equity, we talk about fairness. And this is one area where he um, used prime examples, so where fairness just wasn't there. So I'm gonna ask you as the audience, create an action plan, take a look at this, try to make a difference. That difference is gonna be specific on equity, making sure that everybody's treated not only fairly, but justly. Thank you again, Tom. Um, Vaughn, we got you back now, right? Um, yes. <laughs> okay, great, well, thank you very much. Uh, you will be the next speaker, so I am now gonna introduce Vaughn, a proud uh, American, was born in Cameroon, Africa. He arrived in Detroit May 1st, 1980. Two and a half years shy of his 22nd birthday. Um, he said he did not want to say 21 because in Cameroon, the older you are, the more respect you get. Vaughn is married for 37 years, has three adult children, two grandchildren. He is big on education, as you will see from this presentation. Vaughn, how are you? Uh, thank you, Wade. Um, with all my education, I had trouble uh, connecting this evening maybe because I'm back on the East Coast, but thanks for having me. Um, earlier today, I had the honor to be part of a presentation that uh, Magic Johnson was a guest speaker. And he, he emphasized his success, you have to be better prepared for it. Um, and you gotta work hard, you gotta be honest, you gotta you know, do all you can and make sure that you're ready. Just like Coach Bobby Knight once said, the will to succeed is not nearly as important as the will to prepare to win. So education is big for me because my parents who were not educated, my grandmother who, who wasn't educated told me that uh, to succeed in life, I can either be a doctor, an engineer, or uh, a lawyer. And I didn't have a choice. So, and she said, you have more respect with that education than if you just make money. So school was very important to me. Now, born in Cameroon, we didn't have racism. We had tribalism, where people had preferences based on their tribal origin. But coming to America, um, I got to confess that um, we, I knew that there was racism in America. There was racial injustice. 
and I had to live through it. But having said that, I believe one of the solution to help resolve the problems that we're currently facing in our society is by improving the quality of education and the knowledge of everyone. So we need to start very early um, helping the young people prepare for careers for the future. And it really doesn't really matter what color of your skin or where you are, but if you have the proper exposure and know what careers and what it takes to become, whether it's a lawyer, a medical doctor, or a computer technologist early on, you can better prepare and develop and learn the basic skills, whether it's math, algebra, whatever it takes early on, so that by the time you get to college, you'll be better prepared and you can uh, take what, it, what uh, we stand all the rigors that it takes to get to where you wanna go. Now, do we have to help? How can you make a difference? You definitely can make a difference by mentoring a kid. You can sponsor them. You can work hard and make a friend, get to know people of the different colors. And I believe there was one um, uh, uh, Dr. Gene who did a study, uh, Dr. Jean Elliott. And basically, she's white. She did a study in, uh, with all white people and described the experience of the black person. And then at the end of it and asked by a show of hand, knowing now what you know, which one of you would rather be black? And none of the white people raised their hands. And he said, well, if you don't like that, that what they experienced, then maybe you ought to do something to change it. And that's exactly what we are appealing here that uh, uh, knowing what's going around, what we ought to see, ask ourselves, what is it that we can do to make a change in the society? Now, as a Catholic, I must say, uh, I have to quote Pope Francis here. And he recently said, rivers do not drink their own water. Trees do not eat their own fruit. The sun does not shine on itself. And, if, and um, flowers uh, generate fragrances, but for other people to enjoy. Living, in, uh, uh, living for others is a rule of nature. We all are born to help each other. We all are born to help each other. No matter how difficult it is, life is good when you are happy, but much better when others are happy because of you. So I'm hoping that we all can find a way to make other people happier or happy. And I believe we, we can do that. No matter what we do it for, it will help lift everyone. Like we always say, and those worn boats that say, rising tide lifts all boats. So if we do that, I think we'll be, be a better society. Thank you. Thank you, Vaughn. Uh, very good message. Uh, very much appreciated also. Um, Vaughn has a unique experience because he actually came from uh, Africa uh, where his ethnicity was a majority. And moving here, then uh, he had to change, uh, become readjusted to some different types of life where he was uh, able to witness some of the in inequalities that we have in today's society here in the United States. He did talk about mentoring also, and it seems to be one of the messages that's come through from a few of the panelists, and I believe will continue on. Take a look at that. Um, and again, I think uh, as we look for ways to create action and create change, that's going to be one of the ones that's going to be we're going to be focusing on. Thank you again, Ron. Our next panelist speaker is Michael Rizel. Michael Rizel is a certified public accountant out of Temple, Texas. He serves as Sergeant of Arms for the Rotary Club of Temple South. Now, why they need a Sergeant of Arms, I don't know, but uh, I wouldn't mess in that club at all. Um, but as you'll see, he is a dad first and everything else is a distant second. Mike has a very compelling story that he's gonna share with you this evening. And I want you to take the time to walk in his shoes. Michael, it's all you, thank you. Thanks, White. And I will tell you guests, um, while I have the floor, 
in Texas, it's like nine, almost nine fifteen, and it's right at my bedtime. So you guys bear with me <laughs> because um, there's this there's this misconception that racism is a redneck in a jacked up truck way better flag, but but it's much deeper than that. I continue to be reminded that racism is alive and well with no black person exempt from the hate or discrimination, age, home life, parent involvement, light skin or dark skin, none of that matters. The world around me has taught, has taught us that racism is not always loud and it's not always clear, but it's always da- dangerous and it's always damaging. Racism is being is not being able to meet your son's first grade teachers at Meet the Teacher Night because the teacher was so visibly disgusted by my presence. She couldn't even be bothered to make eye contact with me. I waited and waited, only to realize no matter where I stood or what I said, my son's new teacher was not interested in speaking to me. Racism is having to write a letter to the counselor, vice principal, principal, superintendent, for my six-year-old's classroom to get my six-year-old's classroom changed in the middle of the school year because he was getting treated so poorly based off the color of his skin. Now, I know many of you, the first question you ask is, well, how do you know that? I mean, which is one of the reasons racism thrives because racism is this intangible experience that many don't believe exists because they haven't experienced it personally. And it's upsetting because this burden of proof has been put on black people and it's exhausting. I asked my, for my son to be moved because of the effect she was having on my child. I asked to have my son moved due to the hateful things said to him by someone that I entrusted his care to. My son could not understand why his teacher ignored his raised hand continuously or told him he was a bad kid or the, the deal that finally broke the camel's back for me as a parent is the defeat and sadness my son brought home one late evening while we were reading out, doing our nightly reading like we always do. He hesitantly, you know, said, that something happened today at school. And I'm like, oh, man, what'd you do? And he was like, well, no, no, it's okay. Never mind. Let's keep reading. I said, no, you need to tell me, but, but you're not in trouble. I'd rather work through things with you. That way, he tells me the story about the book Brown Bear, Brown Bear almost everyone's favorite childhood book. A student called him a baby because he checked this book out at the library. So he told the teacher, like I taught him to do. And she tells my son, well, he's right. That's a book your little sister can read. I was livid to say the least. And still, my son will come home with different ideas about how he can make this teacher like him. Like, let's buy her a teacup because she loves tea in the morning. My son loves to learn. He loves going to school. He absolutely loves pleasing people. So I would never stand by and watch someone steal the shine from his smile and make him believe he wasn't worthy. The reason I say racism thrives is because of the shame a black parent is made to feel when questioning why their child is being treated differently. Involved, dedicated parents should not feel retaliation when questioning the care or education of their children. Racism thrives because I didn't, I didn't want to mention this being about race. I mean, honestly, I didn't want to believe it. But it also thrives because, it's, because it's, it's not always said or made clear why hate is being spewed towards a person. I mean, being a black person and talking to an all-white administration in an all-white community, the last thing you want to mention is race because any credibility that you, you did have could, could possibly quickly go out of the window. Anyway, I want to end this quick story by, by letting you know, by letting you all know that when in the meeting to have my son, my son's uh, class removed, the principal, she just flat out asked me and said, do you think this is racially charged? And I painfully admit it. I think so due to the observations in class and, and the stories my son bring home involving white students and, and other detailed examples. She looked at the counselor and she solemnly said, yeah, this isn't the first time. So that is how I know. There are things that that will happen that won't go viral or be viewed as stream enough to cause an uproar. Landon, he won't get a hashtag for feeling less than. A life won't always be lost, physically anyway. However, these blatant inequalities is what all the fuss is about. 
there there are some that think that this is about politics or that this is about one bad cop. Some think that this is about a flag or a group of people looking for a handout. That can't be further from the truth. I've worked for everything that I have and I love with everything that I have. So hear me, your friend, your fellow Rotarian, let's turn off the news, leave Fox and CNN alone for a day. Let's not get our perspective from sources known for their bias. Let's walk into the communities that we don't understand. Let's talk to our colleagues, people we break bread with, people we call brother and sister, hear their stories. I can almost guarantee you that there is a mic in each of your communities that has an experience to share. Allow people grace as this communication is driven forward. Not everyone is going to have this platform that, that we've been blessed with to express themselves. And so I, you know, in, in speaking to people and driving this communication, I've accumulated this list for those that are looking for some eye-opening sources um, or sources that can help them in their journey to allyship. Um, I'm going to put my email in the chat box soon after I finish. Um, pl please, please feel free to reach out to me. I'll be happy to share with anyone. And I look forward to, to this uncomfortable communication because honestly, it is the only way forward. Thank you for your time. Michael, thank you very much. Excellent, excellent presentation. Um, for those of you that I asked to walk in his shoes, I hope you did. Uh, you get the actual feeling of that one. It's an interesting point that he brings up and that is uh, we talk about the educational system and how it seems that it's in education and the educational institutes that these barriers are created. The innocence of a child that did not see color all of a sudden is thrown into an area where that color all of a sudden becomes him as the minority. So remember that because that may be one of the action points that we do have to bring forward. Michael, once again, thank you very much. Uh, we'll be looking forward to talking to you very soon. Our next speaker, is a very good friend of mine. She's from the Rotary Club of Duarte. Many of us call her the first lady of Rotary. Um, I got to have the opportunity of speaking with her quite a few times uh, in different areas. And I kind of wonder, because we keep running into each other, if in fact she's stalking me, but then I kind of realize that, well, maybe look like I'm stalking her. So Sylvia, my apologies if it feels like I'm stalking you, but I'm really not. Um, she wrote um, a quote that she asked me to read for the presentation. These are personal experiences examined from an educator's perspective. No slides from my head and heart to yours. Sylvia, thank you for joining us. Are you stalking me, Wayne? Okay, so what do I know about being black? I just wanna tell you about two small experiences I had, and I'm telling them to you now from my perspective as an educator. This is a story of how I was chosen, rejected, and then chosen again. I grew up in a third world country in Jamaica <clears throat> where the ever-present biases were around class more than ethnicity. However, within every ethnicity, as in many places today, there are some biases around skin color. So being a light-skinned Black placed me higher on the totem pole than my darker-skinned brothers and sisters. So I left Jamaica in 1951, having just turned 16, and entered Hunter College of the City University of New York. In my British high school, I had already earned a senior Cambridge school certificate with exemptions from Oxford University, which placed me almost to my sophomore year. Missing from the prerequisites were the obligatory history, American history classes. I had to take those. Among the classes for which I was registered were English literature. My forte, I'm coming from a British high school, and zoology. My grades, except for math classes, were poor. And I finally figured out why the math classes were OK, because they couldn't be graded on a continuum. They were either right or wrong. Anything else I had to write could be graded on a continuum. Well. One night, we were given <clears throat> an assignment to analyze Milton's poem on his blindness, and it was right up my alley. I knew I could ace this, so I set about writing my heart out. I was proud of my paper, and even thought my teacher might read it to the class, as she had for other students. 
I turned it in and waited expectantly for my grade. To my chagrin, when I received it, it was a D. In unbelief, I waited until the class was over. And then I went to the professor and I asked, what could I have done to have earned a better grade on this paper? Oh, it was a very good paper, she said. But I don't think you wrote it. I cannot remember what I said. I was taught not to argue with teachers. That's part of the culture when I grew up, not to argue with teachers and others in authority. My zoology class fared no better. I shared a guinea pig's dissection with two non-minority students. We had lunch right after lab, so we often had lunch together. I thought they were my friends and I look forward to seeing them for four to five hours each week. Though they often talked about study groups, I was never invited to join them. Then one Saturday, I was walking down the Grand Concourse in the Bronx, that's the Rodeo Drive of the Bronx. And I saw these two girls walking towards me. I got so excited because I had never seen them out of school. They came right up alongside, gave a curt hello and kept walking. I couldn't understand what had just happened. I went home and I told my mother about it and her matter of fact response was, well, you're not in school anymore, so you're not friends in their neighborhood. Well, it was difficult to understand. I learned all this very slowly. And near the end of the year, I was called by my counselor and advised that my GPA was below matriculation level and I would be dropped as a tuition free student. I explained how hard I had tried. And I asked what I could do. She outlined a plan of action, which included library time and study groups. And she told me she would keep tabs on my progress. This woman knew what was happening. She would keep tabs until I raised my GPA to 2.5. She was sensitive to my need to be successful in college. She did just that. And in two years of attending school at night, and with no grades under a B, I re-earned my matriculation. She continued to monitor my progress until I earned my BA. Without her as an ally, I would probably not have had a college education. Absence of education is what relegates many of us to the position we find ourselves in. Not only was she non-racist, she was anti-racist. She put herself on the line to help me get through this problem. When many years later, I had earned my PhD, I received a note from her telling me that of all the 10 students who lost their matriculation that year, I was the only one allowed to continue. And she was so gratified to learn that I had gone on to earn an advanced degree. Was she an ally? Did she make a difference? She did something about something she could change. Many people of color end in a standard of poverty because their education is lacking. She helped me to get past that. She was my ally. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Excellent, excellent. And very much appreciate it, taking the time actually to come out and see us this evening. I know how busy your schedule is. Um, Again, for the audience, uh, we started with education and we found out the inequities that education could have on discriminating. From there, it creates opportunities or lack of opportunities. Again, equity. From there, that equity then turns into inequities of economy, of the economics, of the way that you could finance yourself and, and make a living. Ideally, and we heard this three times now, um, it takes a mentor to make that change. To create that change. We as Rotarians should be looking at that position of becoming mentors. I think that's probably the most important message we've received so far from the previous and Sylvia speaking.